You know, when you're in pain, as we all know, you don't really think about much else. It limits what you can do in terms of using your hand if you have arthritis. 80% of us will experience chronic pain at some point in our lives. Painkillers have become a multi-billion dollar industry. Some cause side effects, especially if they contain morphine. Uh, there are also problems with addiction. Now, drug companies are hoping to develop a better way to treat pain, thanks to an American scientist whose research has opened the door for the next generation of painkillers. Dr. David Julius, Chair, Biology Department, University of California, San Francisco. Julius works in this lab. When we're done with this, probably next week, we should go and see Matt. His field of research is the sense of touch. Our ability to detect pressure or light brush, our ability to detect temperature over a wide range from hot to cold. And our ability to feel pain, the focus of a groundbreaking study Julius began in 1994. What triggers pain and where does it start and end? If we understand how that works, we can eventually uh, prevent it or suppress it. Pain warns us of threats to our well-being. But when pain becomes chronic... Rather than being helpful uh, as a warning system, it becomes debilitating. One of the most commonly used painkillers contain morphine derived from opium poppy. But the drug works on the brain stem that also controls our breathing as well as affects our intestinal muscles. One of the side effects is respiratory depression. Constipation's another problem. Is there a way to stop pain with drugs that won't affect other organs of our body? Drugs that would target only the part responsible for detecting pain? Our nerve cells that activate our sense of touch. So that if you were to develop a drug that affected that site, you wouldn't have to worry that it would be affecting the function of other cells in the nervous system or in the body. To study how pain works, Julius used the fruit spicy food lovers can't do without, chili pepper. If you eat a hot pepper, you're in pain. Or if you chop hot peppers and then stick your finger in your eye, this is excruciatingly painful. Chili pepper contains an active molecule, capsaicin, that causes a burning sensation. This molecule has a very specific and amazing uh, effect on nerve fibers that are involved in pain sensation. Nerve fibers are found in many areas of our body, including our eyes, lips, skin, and internal organs. They detect pain, including pressure, heat and cold, or chemical irritants. When the fibers are activated, they send an electric signal up the spinal cord to the brain, which interprets it as a pain sensation. Is there a specific protein that sits on the nerve fiber and uh, is activated by capsaicin? and then initiates this electrical signal so that you can sense this as pain. So we've used the chili pepper extract and capsaicin as the tag to find this protein on the nerve fiber. For three years, Julius tried but failed to make any headway. At one point, he told his wife, Holly, he was giving up. I looked at her and said, maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe I should just give up. And she looked at me and said, you know this is going to be really important. So stop messing around and get it done. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, you're right, we should get it done. It was do or die. We were going to hit this problem with whatever approaches we, we knew we could take. Six months later, <laughs> in 1997, he cloned the specific protein that interacts with chili and fires the pain signal to the brain, the capsaicin receptor. It was one of the first discoveries in the beginning of the use of molecular biology and genetics to really look at pain signaling mechanisms. It turns out the capsaicin receptor is the same one that detects heat once the temperature goes up to 43 degrees centigrade. This becomes pain producing because it's telling you that this could be injurious to your body, to your skin, and, and you shouldn't be in temperature that hot. Right after discovering the receptor, Julius phoned his wife. Holly, how's it going? This is Dave calling. And he called mm -hmm. and he said, I think we have it. 
I think we got it. I said, I think we know that. And we I was so excited. And then he said, but don't tell anybody. And I was with my mother. And he said, don't tell your mother. You know, as a so scientist, excited. sometimes you get really excited. But you don't want to tell anybody yet because you could be wrong. And you really, yeah. want to make, you really want to wait till you're sure. So, Philip, you getting ready for your swim meet on Saturday? Yeah. David and Holly have one son. Did you work on your dive? Because you sort of look like a flying squirrel. Say <laughs> what? Holly Ingram is also a biologist at UC San Francisco. We were at a uh, conference. At a meeting together, we went to this, there was a very small meeting in Copenhagen, and they sat everyone alphabetically, uh -huh. according to their last name, so Julius and Ingram, so we were sitting next to one another, and that's how we first met. And then after a few minutes, I realized, hey, this, she's a beautiful woman, too, aside from being a good scientist. So. <laughs> David has settled down with Holly in San Francisco, where his wife's family lives. You're originally from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and what do you like about San Francisco? You know, San Francisco is a beautiful city, especially on a day like today when it's sunny. It's uh, geographically, it's beautiful. There's lots of rolling hills and vistas. So I like being on the water. Uh, even when I lived in, you know, New York City. You can go out and do all kinds of things. You know, the other thing I like about San Francisco is that uh, there are some really great academic institutions. UC San Francisco is one of the best biomedical research institutes in the world. For an academic scientist, it's a playground. The same playground where years later, he employed the same technique he used to find capsaicin to identify the protein that detects cold. He used mint leaves. What makes uh, mint leaves uh, generate a cold sensation is, uh, is, a, is one chemical in them called menthol. This experiment confirms his finding. This mouse stays only on the right corner where the temperature is a comfortable 30 degrees centigrade. It avoids the other side where it's colder at 20 degrees. But this mutant mouse moves between the two sides. A protein in its genes that detects cold was genetically removed. If this mouse cannot make the protein that senses menthol or senses cold, that this animal behaviorally would not be able to discriminate between a surface that's warm and a surface that's cold. The experiment has huge implications for treating pain. If a protein that detects stimuli like cold, heat or pain can be deactivated from firing signals to the brain, pain can be stopped at its source by drugs that won't affect other parts of our body. Drug companies are now doing clinical animal and human trials to develop new drugs based on Julius's research. So the challenges are to find drugs that modulate the activity of the receptors and quiet the nerve fibers down, but to allow it we need it to tell us about acute, acutely dangerous situations like sticking our hand in a pot of hot water or, getting, or hitting ourselves with a hammer. We want to maintain that kind of pain signal. That's a good pain signal. We want to get rid of the pain signal that's inappropriately generated uh, and drives chronic pain syndromes. I would say, without being held to this, that I think the next decade will tell us whether these targets are really good targets for new pain drugs. Do you have with uh, you know, the recent uh, information we have, uh, I think it would be very appropriate. Roger Nichol, pharmacology professor, UC San Francisco. What really led to his um, blossoming as, a, as a, a true scientist was his cloning of this capsaicin receptor. And he has transformed that field uh, from uh, a very descriptive type of uh, science into a, 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 given it a molecular basis. And the papers that he publishes are noted for their just extraordinary clarity and simply gems. Should I open it? Yeah. Julius has continued to clone more protein receptors, including the one for wasabi, or Japanese horseradish, backed by a staff of eight researchers. He's a scientist of great stature, yet he's very personable, and he's actually here in his office with the door always open for us. I guess maybe he also asked Clement, um, the other Clement. Mm -hmm. uh, Whenever you have any questions or you have any new ideas, uh, he's more than welcome to discuss it, to discuss it with you. We have a, like a coffee time at three. We talk about life, we talk about science. This is what I've done the last two years and I've enjoyed it. 
As a scientist, you really do what you do because you're driven by curiosity. I mean, I remember once my father telling me, you know, you're very fortunate you go to work every day because you, you're fascinated by it and because you have a passion for it and you enjoy it. And he said you should always appreciate that because that's not true for most people.